Mark Rogers TV continuing to knock out as many bowl previews as we can possibly get to, and that includes the St. Petersburg Bowl, where UConn back in postseason play for the first time since the 2010 season. On the line, we've got Amon Kitwai joins us from uh, Rivals.com, uh, the UConn site there, and also the UConn blog. So, Amon, we appreciate the time. Always a good uh, discussion with you and uh, a more pleasurable discussion than the last several we've had because this Bob Diaco-led program has really turned things around recently. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, definitely a lot in question with the football program and all of our previous conversations. You know, even as recently, uh, going as recently back as, you know, the midpoint of this season where uh, the Huskies are 3-5, and five, coming off of a big loss on the road to Cincinnati. Uh, and you look at the rest of the schedule and there's uh, games against East Carolina, Temple, and uh, Houston on the schedule. And you need to, and, and Tulane as well. And we needed to win three of those to get to bowl eligibility. So um, it was looking pretty unlikely, uh, obviously, but then the Huskies got a really, really great win at home against East Carolina behind a very strong defensive effort. Uh, we're able to squeak out a win uh, under a torrential downpour in New Orleans against Tulane, despite scoring zero offensive points, uh, with, a, with a pick six being the, the deciding points in that 7-3 to three win, uh, and, then, and then pulling off a massive upset victory uh, you know, at home against previously undefeated Houston uh, to propel them into bowl eligibility. So it's been... Uh, a great, a great run. Uh, and, you know, I think Bob, Di like I said, I mean, there was skepticism around Bob Diaco and whether this era would be a success. I was always kind of cautiously optimistic. We continued to see good results on the recruiting trail. Um, but to obviously have some on-field success uh, has been a tremendous, at, at this level, you know, to get to six wins has been a tremendous development for the program uh, in Bob Diaco's second year. Yeah, it's been a, a situation where you're not going to blow anyone away in regards to the stat sheet. So if anybody's looking for 1,000-yard rushers, a quarterback with 35 touchdown passes, anything like that, that, this this is not the team. This is the team that's a very lunch pail team, uh, and, and they bring it uh, on both sides of the football uh, in the trenches and, and do, the, do, do the little things right. Before we get to the breakdown of this matchup, though, your quarterback situation – uh, is kind of in peril or a bit unstable at this point. Uh, we'll we'll see what happens. Yeah, it's 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 uncertain. We're not really a hundred percent sure what the situation is. Um, so Brian Shereps, he's been our starter all year. He's a transfer from NC State. Won the starting job this off season. Has played well. Uh, he's a redshirt sophomore. You know, so he's filled that game manager kind of role. He's a nice. Uh, dual threat. He can definitely take off and run, make plays with his legs. So he's been a good player for us all season. Um, but against Houston, actually, pretty early in that Houston game, he actually got uh, he got hit in the head as he was sliding. So had a had a head injury. Um, he was removed from the game. He didn't he didn't go back into the Houston game, and then he missed our season finale against Temple. So uh, and that game did not go very well. Uh, we got we got beaten beaten pretty badly by Temple with our backup quarterback in there. So, um, Sharefs has been practicing. He has been cleared to play, um, but you know it kind of remains to be seen what exactly is is going to happen. Um, you know, obviously anything can happen, and and obviously you want to err on the side of caution here if if there's any symptoms that resurface or anything like that. You know the smart move would probably be to sit him, you know, for a, a game, you know, exhibition game at the end of the season in Florida. So uh, we'll see. The expectation or the, or the belief is that he will be playing. Um, we'll see. So, again, based on the stats sheet, it wouldn't seem to be a huge loss. Uh, you talked about game manager status, and the stats would speak to that. Nine touchdowns, seven picks, 60% completion percentage. But the results in the Temple game would speak otherwise, that uh, he, he really uh, led the offense and, and uh, grasped the offense and, and is the guy that they need to have in place. Otherwise, maybe a little bit of a heavier dose of Arkeel Newsom. 
who had a tremendous year. And for those of us who, who reside in Connecticut, this is a kid that's been on the radar for quite some time, a bit of a high school legend uh, in the state of Connecticut. And he had a nice season uh, catching 40 passes out of the backfield and led the team in rushing. Yeah. Newsom has been great. Um, and it's, and you're absolutely right. It's great to see a Connecticut player doing so well at UConn. Um, and uh, he's actually, there's another guy on the offense, Noel Thomas, a wide receiver also from Connecticut. Uh, who's doing very well. But yeah, you know, Newsom, what's really great about Newsom is his big playability. Um, you know, the fact that that uh, that Houston game, for example, very first play from scrimmage, he takes a run down the middle, you know, 45 yards down the field or something like that. 90-yard uh, touchdown run against East Carolina, 22-yard touchdown catch against Villanova in the season opener. So he has this this big playability this escapability that's very exciting that people love to watch. Um, and, you know, for a UConn team that hasn't had a lot, I mean, hasn't had a lot to cheer for at all, but even when they were doing pretty well, was not a very exciting football team. Uh, it's, it's been great to see. And, and the fact that he's just a sophomore uh, and he's performing so well at the Division One level uh, obviously gives us a lot of optimism for, for, you know, what kind of career he can have here at UConn. Yeah, you mentioned Noel Thomas with 54 catches. He's been targeted uh, by far more than anyone. Three touchdown receptions for him. Uh, let's look at the defense, uh, Amon. Uh, 13th in the nation in pass defense. This Jamar Summers is a ball hawk with seven picks in the last eight games. Uh, wrapped up the Houston win with an interception. Just uh, outline the defense because obviously this has been uh, the stabilizing factor on this team. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, it's... Um, it's a lot of just talent, depth, and experience really at all three levels. Um, on the defensive line, you know, we run a 3-4-ish kind of alignment. And uh, on the defensive line, there's two seniors. Uh, the standout among the among the seniors is, is the nose guard, Julian Campeni, a big space eater, able to really crush blockers. Um, and then – uh, he's not a senior, but the other defensive lineman, the third defensive lineman, is uh, Foley Fatukasi, who is getting a lot of love, uh, a lot of hype in terms of, you know, being a being a pro prospect. He's just a sophomore as well, um, and he's been extremely good. And I think there's been a couple of games he missed, I think a half of a game uh, or something like that, and, and then maybe another game after that. And his absence was was absolutely felt. And then at linebacker, uh, you know, we've got two seniors, Marquise Van and Graham Stewart, um, two of the leading tacklers on the team. Stewart is is kind of one of those, you know, heart and soul of the team kind of guys. He's a transfer over from Florida, um, also a Connecticut guy, uh, someone who just plays with a lot of intensity out there. Um and then the secondary's got Andrew Adams, uh, you know, really solid, really solid safety, uh, and Obi Melifanu, who's an extremely athletic safety. His other counterpart at the free safety position, who is, you know, really starting to make some plays on the ball as well. Uh, and then, yeah, Summers, Summers with seven interceptions has been great. Um, the defensive approach has been kind of that bend but don't break philosophy, uh, where it's, you know, we're gonna we're going to make a team beat us with, with sustained drives. You know, how often can a college team put together a 12 play 84 yard drive for a touchdown? Uh, we're banking or betting on not so often. Uh, and, and that has kind of been the case, like you said, with these kind of ugly slug them out, grind them out kind of games, uh, just kind of do, doing whatever it takes to win. But, um, you know, the defense, they don't, they don't blitz a lot. They don't do a lot of anything very exotic. They just kind of hang back, play their assignments, and, and it's, um, you know, it's been working really, really well. Yeah, you mentioned hey, Adams, uh, 83 tackles leads the team. He also has three picks, and Pratikasi uh, leads the team with uh, seven sacks. So just a sophomore, so that's going to feel good that uh, he's going to be back for another year as well. I'm looking at the scoring differential for these teams. So measuring Conference USA and the American Athletic Conference, you would generally think them to be a pretty even matchup. Obviously, the top half of the American Athletic Conference, or certainly that top four, has separated itself at least this season. 
uh, being much better competition. And for the most part, Connecticut held up very well against uh, three of those opponents, especially, obviously, the Houston win and going 6-6. Six and six. But Connecticut outscored by about two points per game. Marshall's outscoring its opponents by 15 points per game. Uh, what, what do we know about the thundering herd this year? Yeah, I mean, you know, Marshall Marshall made a lot of headlines last year. Uh, obviously, you will recall as one of the uh, few remaining undefeated teams towards the end of the season. They faltered at the very end, uh, falling to Western Kentucky. And, uh, you know, people thought they might take kind of a big step back this year. They were losing their their star quarterback and, and some other key players. But uh, they've really stormed back with a very nice season. They have um, – they had nine wins. They have a win over Purdue uh, on their resume as well. Um, and, you know, I think the Conference USA American, you know, I think um, I think actually the American has shown a lot of depth even beyond its top four um, because you've got teams that were not – that you did not mention there, but teams like Cincinnati and USF, um, you know, who have looked pretty good. Um, I think I think you know USF is is a is one of the great stories of this this college football season. Um, you know when you think about the turnaround that Willie Taggart has orchestrated there. So um, you know for the Huskies to be able to play close games against those kinds of teams, uh, against USF, against Missouri, against Navy, um, you know to me it, it means that they are a little bit more battle tested. Uh, they've been in more situations where the game is on the line. They've had that that tension exists uh, for a majority of the season, really. And, um, you know, hope, hopefully that's something that um, prepares them very well for this matchup and for those those key moments in the game against Marshall. Um, I definitely think Marshall's a very, very good team. I mean, and, and by all indications, they are the favorite, you know, going into this game. They're, I think, four-and-a-half to five-point favorites, according to Las Vegas. Um, the football outsiders F plus efficiency rankings have them about 20 or so spots ahead of UConn. Um, you know, so, so they're definitely a very good team and, and um, they're a defensively strong team as well, which will, which um, for UConn and its weakness, its biggest weakness being the offensive line, you know, that's a problem. That's a, that's an, an obvious point of concern. So, you know, you don't, you don't, it's not necessarily a, a this conference versus that conference thing. Marshall is just a very good team. Uh, and I think they will be a really good challenge for UConn. Um, and, and it would be really, really tough for, for UConn to win on Saturday. Yeah, it could be a third consecutive 10-win season for Marshall. Uh, in amongst those wins, you, you make the comparison in regards to schedules. They only did defeat one team with a winning record, so they beat up on the lesser foes in Conference USA and in the non-conference slate, Purdue being kind of an exception, being a Big Ten team, but still a losing team and probably the worst team uh, in the Big Ten. We see that Chase Litton, you mentioned uh, the quarterback, uh, not coming back uh, from last season, uh, lit in 59%, 22 touchdowns. They got this Evan McKelvey on defense who's all over the place with 113 tackles and nine tackles for loss. So, yeah, they they um, they they pass and run. You know, they're, they're not an um, imbalanced offense, that's for sure, because they've got receivers all over the place with 40, 45, 55 catches uh, led by um, Devontae Allen with 56 catches. So, should be an interesting matchup, and, and as you mentioned, the South Bowl, the uh, South Florida Bulls, on as we speak uh, with Willie Taggart on the sidelines, uh, nine and three this season, uh, another success story in the American Athletics. So um, you got a pretty good feel for this one. Uh, for today's game? No, for the uh, UConn game. Yeah, you know it's it's going to be tough. I think you know another another kind of underrated uh, aspect of this matchup for UConn is that they will be without Tommy Myers. Uh, Myers is a tight end who has also played some H back, also a Connecticut guy. Um, actually great story. His, his father played football for UConn and his mother, uh, played for Gino Oriema for the, for the, uh, women's basketball team. Um, so Tommy Myers is a guy, he got injured in that Houston game as well. He's a key cog of the offense. He was just a very versatile guy that let the offense do a lot of things. And I honestly feel as though his, uh, absence was felt almost as much as Brian Sheref's absence um, in that Temple finale. So, for you and you know, he was a guy. You know, in the Villanova game, he had some big, some big plays. He's had some big plays in a couple of games. 
UConn's been trying to get him more involved. You know, the passing game has struggled a little bit for various reasons. Um, but to not have him is, is also a tough, uh, a tough loss for the Huskies. So um, I think it, it's the matchup that it's going to come down to is the Marshall front seven against UConn's offensive line. Um, if UConn's offensive line holds up nicely, um, that, then they can make some things happen and, uh, uh, you know, should make it a pretty good game. If not, if the offense, you know, if the offense gets completely stymied, um, then we're probably in for a really long game and it, and it doesn't even matter how good the UConn defense plays because eventually they'll be on the field just too much. Uh, and you're absolutely right. You know, Marshall has a really balanced offensive attack. Um, and they seem to, you know, I mentioned, you know, adversity a little bit. They haven't necessarily had a lot of adversity on the, on the field in their games, but they've dealt with a ton of injuries across this season to key players at running back, wide receiver, offensive, defensive line, and, and seem to have persevered. So, um, you know, they're definitely, they definitely have some, some strong character. And, um, you know, if, if I had to make a prediction, you know, right now at this moment, I'd, I'd give the edge to Marshall. I think Marshall would win in a pretty close game, three to four points. Um, but but I would give the edge to them, to be honest, after after taking some time to evaluate the matchup. Okay, UConn back in postseason play for the first time in five years. The Huskies also looking for the first winning record to complete a season since 2010, sitting at six and six. Amon Kidwai joining us from Rivals.com on the UConn site there and also the UConn blog on SB Nation. Aman, it's always uh, good to have you on here. Provide some insight for us. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Mark. Appreciate it.